speak to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, last week, uh, Kathy uh, spoke about feeding the 5,000 and she gave you a heads up to Peter walking on water. And uh, we videotaped a Facebook uh, live. Kathy's message has been watched uh, by almost 300 people so far. So that's uh, quite remarkable, slightly more than we're in church last Sunday in the summer. We, we called this the dog days of summer. Why is this called the dog days of summer? Is it too cold to get up? Yeah, it's typically uh, so hot that even the dogs don't get up and they're lying there. And what do you not want to do? You don't want to disturb them. The dog uh, days of summer. But uh, thank God today's a bit uh, cooler and a bit uh, clearer. So after Jesus fed the 5,000 people, it said straightway, verse 22, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So you can imagine it's sort of almost like the a festival of hope, these thousands of people, and what did Jesus do with them? Yeah, he, he got rid of them all. And he immediately uh, went away. He went up to a mountain apart uh, to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, these pictures that Kathy are shown, they've recently been painted at Richmond Emmanuel Church, where our bishop Silas is. And so I, I was very moved. We were once a month of our time with Abba, and prayer meeting second Saturdays, we do it at Richmond Emmanuel. So we were uh, copying the Bible, and uh, Glenn was there, and I was there, Kathy uh, was there, and so Jesus, he went up the mountain. Now, why would Jesus go up a mountain to pray? To get away. Yeah, in for silence and solitude. Uh, during the summer, how many of you ever get around to reading a book that you've been planning on reading for a long time? Do any of you ever do summer reading? Yeah, and I've been planning on reading this book, Silence, for literally years. I can't tell you how long I've had this book. And do you ever look at a book and say, someday I should read that book? And be, because we moved, uh, we had to put all of our books into boxes, and now we've been unboxing, and I found this book, the book that I'd never read by Shusaka Endo. Have any of you read the book Silence by Shusaka Endo? I highly commend it to you. What motivated me to finally read the book is Janice and I, we decided to catch a movie. And you know when you try to catch a movie, sometimes it's hard to uh, find a decent movie. And this movie, Silence, uh, was being shown by Morton Scorsese. Is that how you pronounce it? And I, I said, I've got that book. I've never read it, but maybe I can watch it. Uh, and so we watched him, we were very moved. It turned out this fellow, Shusaka Endo, who passed on, he was Japan's foremost, foremost novelist. He was the leading 
writer in Japan, and he was a believer in Jesus in Japan. Oh, that isn't as common in Korea. There is a revival. And so when you run into a Christian, you almost expect them. I mean, when you run into a Korean, you almost expect them nowadays to be Christians. Uh, but the Japanese, there, uh, there was very significant persecution of uh, Christians. At one point, uh, there used to be 400,000 Christians, and the Christians were even welcome in the inner circles of the Japanese. But then there was a turning uh, against the Christians they were seeing as foreigners, and they began to be terribly persecuted. And they particularly targeted the priests. And what they would do is they would, they would torture the congregation until the priest would step uh, on a picture of the crucified Christ. And then they'd start, they'd stop torturing the congregants. And many of the priests, because they loved their, their flock, they, they would actually stab on the crucified um, picture of Christ. And the book is called Silence. Uh, because it was a terrible uh, time of suffering for the Japanese Christians, and they wonder, uh, where is God in our suffering? And what they discovered is that Jesus, he wasn't absent in the silence. He was there suffering with them, and even when they tread on his crucified uh, face. He was suffering uh, with them. So here's uh, Jesus off in silence and solitude. Silence can be a very powerful tool of spiritual breakthrough. I was so much impressed uh, by this book, I turned it into, guess what? A Deep Code Prayer article, which will be coming out in September. So he's, he's up there. He's all alone. And we live in a noisy, busy culture where it's very difficult to be alone. And there's Jesus. He's alone. And verse 24 says, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. How many of you have been to Israel? Have any of you been to Israel? Janice. Funny, I, I saw you there. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, the, there is only uh, one major lake in all of Israel that's drinkable. It's, it's the Sea of Galilee, also called Gennesaret. And that's where Israel gets most of its water supply, both for drinking and agriculture. If, if you want to imagine what the Sea of Galilee is like, think of the Lake Okanagan with those mountains around. And because of these mountains around the Sea of Galilee, there are actually wind funnels that uh, come through the mountain valleys, and out of the blue, a peaceful uh, lake can suddenly be a raging, almost tornado, or like hurricane. And this is what happened. And it says in verse uh, 25, in the fourth watch uh, on the night, what time is the fourth watch of the night? Anybody? About uh, 
in the morning, and what are fishermen doing out there at three o'clock in the morning? Yeah, often that's when you get your best fishing. Now, why why is it why is it better to fish early in the morning? Does anybody know any? Do we have any fishermen here, or fisherwomen? Yeah, there's something about early in the morning they they tend to fish. I was I was remember going out with my grandfather who moved up to the Sunshine Coast for the fish, and we'd be out on his boat. It would be cold, and we'd be sitting out there freezing at five in the morning. Anyone ever done that? You were fished at five in the morning. Yeah, it's memorable. Yeah, and the ship uh, was there, and Jesus, he walks, walks on the sea. So Jesus, he walks out to them. Now, today, we're, I'm looking for a volunteer who will be willing to practice walking on water. Do we have one? Okay, well, maybe the next service. Okay, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were just so happy, and they said, Thank you, Jesus, for coming to rescue us. We're so glad you're here. Is that what they did? No, they didn't. I'm glad you're paying attention. They were troubled. Do you ever get troubled when Jesus turns up in your life? Is that an interesting thing? He turns up and they're troubled. And they, they said, it's a spirit. It's, it's a ghost. And they uh, cried out, for fear, so they're absolutely freaked out. That's translation from the Greek. And verse 27, but this wording, but straightway, <clears throat> straightway, Jesus spoke to them and he said, and this is in a classic English accent, be of good cheer. Doesn't that sound very British? Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. And other translations say, uh, take courage. Or take heart, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And I was thinking, what a powerful statement. We can memorize that. When we're going through the winds and the waves and the storms of our life, and every one of us will. <clears throat> Anybody gone through a life with no storms? I don't see any hands up. Uh, will there be any storms in the future? Yeah, that's, that's the reality of life. And you can remember what Jesus said, because he speaks it to everyone, be of good cheer, take heart, have courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Now, are we ever tempted to be afraid when the storms in our life come? Yeah, we all are. And Jesus, he speaks to every one of us, not just to those disciples. And this is worth memorizing, be of good cheer. So what is he saying? We want to use that expression. What does it mean to be of good cheer? Be hopeful. Oh, be hopeful. What else? Be ah, don't be afraid. Another way of saying it is, uh, to use an old English expression, Cheer up, good chap. Yeah, Jesus is, they, you know, when you go through hard times, you can get disheartened if you're going through a health challenge or an employment challenge or a relationship challenge or whatever. It can be easy to lose heart. What do we say in the liturgy uh, when we go into the great Thanksgiving? I say, the Lord be with you. You say, most of you. And then I say, lift up your hearts. Why do we want to lift up our hearts? Show our love for Jesus. Yeah, because life can press our hearts down. It can get us disheartened. When you lose heart, you lose hope, don't you? And our theme for 2017 is overflowing with hope, serving one another. Be of good cheer. Cheer up. Uh, cheer up. It 
is I. And one of the most powerful things in our life is when we encounter Jesus' presence and we hear him say, it's I. Lo, I'm with you. What did Jesus say? He said, I will, what? Never leave you. What does never mean? Never, ever, ever. I will never, it's I. Don't be afraid. And so when we focus on Jesus' presence, the perfect love casts out what? All fear. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. That would be worth a sermon in itself. That's what we're focusing on. And then Peter answered. And Peter, you know, Peter, when he didn't know what to say, what did he always do? He spoke. And so <clears throat> Peter was this amazing fellow. And, and listen carefully to what he's saying. He's saying, first of all, what's the first word? He says, when we read this together, what does he say? Lord. Lord. Lord, that's a good start. That's a good start. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Lord. So he starts by saying, Lord, <clears throat> but then he kind of ruins it. He says, if it be thou. But at least he's honest, so he's confessing, you're my Lord, but I'm not sure it's you. Now, do people in our culture ever think that way? Yeah, it's that I believe help my unbelief. <clears throat> it's the double-mindedness of our culture. Last year when Mark and I visited 13,000 homes, you get a, a great range of people, including this uh, part of the spectrum. He says, if it be thou, bid me thou come unto thee on the water. What an amazing request. Lord, if it's you, I want to go for a walk on water. When's the last time you tried this? <laughs> yeah. You know what they, they say when you go in a boat, what, what do you always tell people to bring with them? Life preservers. And, and Peter, I don't think he had. I think he had a life preserver. And people in those days, they didn't know how to swim uh, quite often. And Jesus says, come. And Jesus is speaking to each one of us. You know, one of the, <clears throat> you know, we ask him, how do you walk on water? What's the absolute bottom line for walking on water? Impossible. Right? The impossible. The impossible. And Kathy Priest spoke that last week. Stepping? Yeah, you gotta get out of the boat. You can have all the faith in the world, but if you don't get out of the boat, and sometimes it's the last thing, understandably, we want to do. We don't want to get out of the boat, but God is saying it's time to get out of the boat. Step out. And, and you know, if you want a spiritual breakthrough in your life, a lot of it is getting outside of our comfort zone and stepping out. And, and he walks on water, he goes towards Jesus, and you go, that's amazing. That's amazing. You know, the last time I walked on water, I wasn't as successful. I tried it on the Sea of Galilee, and I didn't take it very far. And then, there's a but. And in our spiritual walk, there's often buts. Sometimes we're, we're going by faith, we're walking on water, and we've got our eyes on Jesus, and then, but, he got his eyes off Jesus, and what happened? Yeah, he saw the wind boisterous and he was afraid. And there's something about fear that can cripple us. Fear and faith are like opposites. And the temptation is we get our eyes on Jesus. And where do we get our, our eyes on? On the problems. And instead of magnifying Jesus, we magnify our problems. How many of you ever worried your way to a breakthrough? How many of you have you got a problem in life because you don't worry enough and you need, uh, you need to have lessons on how to improve, increase your worry? No, worry, Jesus said, is useless. Uh, fear is useless and beginning to sink. And when we get our eyes off Jesus 
and it's so easy to do that, isn't it? What about this, and what about that, and if only that, and, and it's easy to focus on our problems. The immediate circumstances, they swallow us, and we begin sinking, we lose heart, do we? <clears throat> yeah, beginning to sink, but, but Peter did something very good when he was sinking, what did he do? Yeah, he cried out, and that's what we need to do the next time you're sinking. You cry out, and you say, Lord, save me, in the word Hosanna. <clears throat> Uh, actually translated the word Savior. That's a good word because who is Jesus? He's the Savior. And we can say, Lord, I'm going down for the last time. This week has been awful, Lord. One terrible thing after another. And I'm going down for the last time. I barely made it to church. And he cries out, that's what you can do. And notice what happens in verse 30. When he cried out to Jesus, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. He's got the whole world in his hand. He caught him and he said to him this a statement that we can all address to ourselves when we read it together. Oh, God, Wherefore, Wherefore did you doubt? And we've all got reasons, but Lord, the wind and the waves and the problems and, and I was sinking and, and it was all and I was disheartened and nothing was working and he, and he gently rebukes us oh you of little faith and sometimes our faith is pretty small isn't it and our fears get big and when our fears get big we're tempted to panic and you notice how helpful it is when we panic Panic, you know, at work. And, and uh, Janice retired recently, and one of the times when people have been the most tempted to panic is around fridges. Yeah, and doesn't panicking help? It doesn't. <clears throat> well, now a little faith, and, and we go, oh Lord, I wish I had more faith. And then the good news is even if we have mustard seed faith, God can use us, we can move on. Why did you doubt? And sometimes we just have to say, uh, like that other disciple, <clears throat> Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Because that's, that's where we all are at different times. Lord, how many of you are ever afraid of the unknown? Or afraid of what might happen next? It's very easy. Have you noticed we can't control life? What happens when we try to control life? We make it worse. Yeah, we need to surrender to let go and let God. And when they came into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped them. And they said, Of truth, thou art the Son of God. And that powerful, out of our deepest crisis can come our greatest profession. And then, then they went and all kinds of people got healed. Um, on August 27th, uh, we're having Pastor uh, Mark and Kwanda Redner uh, coming by a train all the way from Newfoundland. They're actually from Ottawa. And they've been visiting 12 cities across Canada. They're finishing their tour at St. Simon's. Yeah, that was amazing. Ruth Johnson arranged it. She came up to me and said, you know, I, I saw this fellow uh, on 700 Club. Any chance we could get him to come to St. Simon's? And uh, inside of me, I was thinking, not very likely, uh, but I like Ruth, so I'll, I'll ask. And I asked him, and he said, yes, it was amazing. So, uh, we're going to have a joint service on August on 27th. And as we often do at St. Simon's, we're going to be praying for the sick. So, if you know anybody that's sick, uh, bring them on August 27th. 
Uh, at 10 a.m. we're going to pray for people and then we're going to have a celebration, a uh, barbecue, and we'll be a potluck and uh, Kathy's going to be uh, passing around the potluck sign up after. So when we're out in our boat and the winds and the waves uh, come, we need to remember, as E.C. Jones said in his book, that we have an unshakable kingdom and an unchangeable person, Jesus Christ. No matter what winds or waves that we face, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <clears throat> the Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken, except for the kingdom, and Jesus will never change. <clears throat> and he always says to us in his terms what he says. He says, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Let's pray. And dear Jesus, when the storms of life come, it's tempting to be disheartened, it's tempting to be afraid, it's <clears throat> tempting to be discouraged. But Lord, you know how to lift up our hearts and you know how to strengthen our faith. And when we cried out to you, you save us. Lord, help us to cry out and say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>